I lift up my eyes to the mountains. My help comes from the Lord. Well, welcome to week six of our fall series, Lift Up, and our psalm this morning will be Psalm 51, but we're going to begin in 2 Samuel chapter 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12, uh, we're not going to put that up on the screen, but we're going to read a story from that passage, so if you would like to follow along, feel free to turn there with me. In ancient times, kings led their armies in war. When the armies uh, gathered together in the dining halls, it was the, the king who addressed them. When the army camped at night, it was the king who walked in their midst. When the army lined up in formation at the edge of the battlefield, it was the king who rode out in front. The king was the leader of the military in every sense of the word. Such was the culture and custom in the ancient Near East. But one year, when David was king in Israel, he decided not to join his men on the battlefield. Instead, he appointed his commander to act as chief in his place, and he stayed home in the comfort of the palace. Many of you know what happened next. One evening, while taking a stroll on the high roof of the palace, he spotted a beautiful woman bathing on the roof of her house. That's where people bathed in those days. And David used his authority as king to have a servant bring her to him. And even after finding out that she was the wife of one of his men, he slept with her. Her name was Bathsheba. And when Bathsheba turned up pregnant, David took additional steps to cover up his abusive power. He brought Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, home from war. He wined him and dined him and tried to connive him into sleeping with his wife. Uriah wouldn't do it because he didn't feel right, enjoying the comforts of home, while the other men were on the battlefield. So unable to deceive Uriah into thinking David's child was his own, David took extreme measures. He had Uriah placed in the thickest part of the next battle and ordered that the company, the rest of the company would withdraw from his position. Uriah was murdered, and it was made to look like an ordinary heroic death in battle. And the king of any other nation at that time would have been in the clear. But the God of Israel is holy and righteous And David should have known, as Moses had once said, if you sin against him, your sin will find you out. 2 Samuel chapter 12 reads, The Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan was the the prophet uh, in Israel at the time. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what Yahweh, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. David said to Nathan, 
I have sinned against the Lord. Now, as we turn to Psalm 51, I wanted us to revisit that story because it helps us understand exactly what was going on in David's life around the time that he wrote this psalm. That story and that fateful decision had a major impact on David's life and on his kingdom. But after he was confronted with his sin and his eyes were opened to the impact of what he did, he repented. And in that, he serves as a model for how to respond in the face of personal failure. Psalm 51 begins, have mercy on me, O God, according to, and and, and I just want to stop there for a second. I know we're eight words into the psalm and there's quite a bit to cover, but I just think it's important for us to internalize this. Pleading for God's mercy, David is going to make his case. And I just wonder how I would finish this sentence if I were him. I wonder how you might finish this sentence if you were him. I think I might say something like, have mercy on me, O God, according to the fact that this is really the only terrible thing I've ever done. I think I I might say, have mercy on me, O God, according to the fact that I'm not that bad when you think about it, that there are way worse kings out there. Have mercy on me, O God, according to the fact that I gave away so much gold to the poor last year. I've made so many sacrifices this year. Have mercy on me, O God, according to the fact that Israel is thriving under my leadership. It's so natural to try and justify ourselves in the face of sin. I'm not as bad as most people. I don't sin like that person. I make up for it in in all these other ways. I mean, everybody has their vices. I go to church all the time. I read my Bible more than others. I'm really a pretty good person. I just made a mistake. Ultimately, the disposition that many of us take in the face of sin, though we would never say it this way, is that God should be merciful to us because we deserve it. Have mercy on me, O God, according to the fact that I'm really not that bad. No, David has it right. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. If we're to understand the forgiveness of God, the very first thing that we must resolve in our own minds and in our own hearts is the universal truth that there is not one among us who deserves his forgiveness. And when we sin and when we come before him to ask for mercy, no good that we have ever done gives us the right to claim his mercy. Let us be sure that God's compassion has nothing to do with us and everything to do with him. Have mercy on me, O God, not because I've earned it, not because I'm not as bad as most people, not because I somehow deserve it, not for any reason having to do with me whatsoever, but because it is who you are, because of your unfailing love and your great compassion. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. When I read this, it seems dismissive of, uh, of the full scope of David's decisions. You know, like he says that he has sinned against God and God alone. Really? I mean, I think Uriah might like a word from beyond the grave, you know? Uh, he, he not only sinned against Uriah, he sinned against Bathsheba, he sinned against the servant that he sent to fetch Bathsheba, he sinned against all the people of Israel over whom he ruled and, and, and for whom he was responsible. There is a ripple effect that sin has. It never just touches your own life or just the lives of the people that are directly involved. It echoes in varying ways and and to varying degrees into the lives of everyone you're connected to. You can actually trace the division of the kingdom and Israel's eventual exile into Babylon all the way back to David's sin with Bathsheba. There were a lot of other sins and a lot of other bad decisions that happened in between those two things. So I'm not saying it's all on David, but that was the first crack 
in the Davidic dynasty and everything else just kind of branched off of it. Never think your sin only affects you. It affects the lives of your spouse, your children, your friends, those for whom you are responsible and those to whom you are accountable. And what isn't said in the psalm, but we would do well to recognize, is that David never should have been in this situation in the first place. He should have been on the battlefield. In the same way that sin never just affects you, it's also never an isolated decision. David should have been with his men at war. Now, did he stay home thinking, I think I'll scope out the rooftops tonight for someone to impregnate, launch a conspiracy to have her husband murdered, and start a snowball effect that will eventually lead to the division of my kingdom and all my people as slaves in a foreign land and tarnish my legacy forever? Of course not. But that's exactly what happened. He probably thought, I fought enough. I'm tired. There are things here that need my attention. I think I'll sit this one out and just rest in the palace. Now, was that a sin? Not categorically, not necessarily, but we take note of how one bad decision puts him in the position to make another bad decision, which leads to another bad decision, and then another, and then another. Sins are almost never isolated decisions made in a vacuum. And they never just affect you. They're usually like this. One poor decision leads to another poor decision, leads to another poor decision. You tell one lie, and then that lie forces you to tell another lie, forces you to tell another lie. You steal $1, and then you steal $10, and then you steal $100. What is the most common phrase cheaters use when trying to explain themselves to their spouse? I didn't intend for it to happen. One thing just kind of led to another because bad decisions tend to stack. Sins are never isolated decisions made in a vacuum. They tend to echo beyond your life into the lives of others. And every sin committed against your neighbor impacts your own relationship with the Lord. This is important for us to realize. Sinning against another person is sinning against God. And I hope that's what David meant when he said, God, against you and you only have I sinned. I hope that what he meant was that my sin is, is so impactful on, on the world around me that it ultimately echoes up into your courts. And, and that is where I'm rightfully judged. Hopefully that's what he meant. But sinning against another person is sinning against God. Each and every person on the planet is made in the image of God, worthy of being treated with kindness and honor and consideration. And for the Christian especially, because love of neighbor is so central to our faith, sinning against your neighbor is unavoidably interconnected with sinning against your creator as well. When you wrong another human being, you are harming your own relationship with the Lord. In Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he instructed his followers not to offer gifts to the Lord if they had unresolved conflict with a neighbor. Look at this. He said, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them then come and offer your gift. I'm not sure how well many of us have internalized this idea and understood the impact that it has on our, our faith and practice and, and, and our lives as uh, followers of Jesus, but it's clear that there is nothing God cares about more than how we treat one another. And if you have unresolved conflict with your neighbor, he expects you to go and make it right before offering worship to him. To put it another way, to have a fractured relationship with another person fractures your relationship with God. I would encourage you, if you have 
unresolved conflict with anyone, if there's a grudge being held or, or resentment of some kind or unforgiveness or malice toward anyone, go and make it right. This is your mandate as a follower of Jesus. And as far as it is possible for us, as far as it is possible for us, live at peace with all people. If we stand in the church on Sundays singing songs and giving money and listening to sermons, but we do not acknowledge the harm that we have caused in our relationships, we do not forgive and ask forgiveness of others, we do not repent of our sin before God and before neighbor, we have turned our backs on the call to follow Jesus. David goes on with his confession, verse 5. He says, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And this is the confession of anyone who has ever engaged in true self-examination. Every single one of us know that this is a universal experience. There's something broken inside of us. And we still have the capacity for goodness. We, we can be generous and, and we can be loving and we can be trustworthy. We can care for others in profound and, and self-sacrificing ways. There is no question that there is virtue in us. But if we're honest, every one of us know that something inside us isn't quite right. Every human being created in the image of God and beloved by their creator has been tainted with what in Christianity we call a sin nature. That because of mankind's fallen state through the original sin of Adam and Eve and only carried forward by the sin in our own lives and the sins of our family and the sins of our community, we are all cursed with a proclivity to sin that we are predisposed from the moment of our birth and as our brains develop and our personalities develop and we become who we are going to become, we are predisposed to do what is wrong. The, the, de the, the, the deck is stacked against us from the beginning. We are working from a disadvantage. That's just true of all of us. And that's why we need the grace and the mercy and the goodness of the Lord. Cleanse me with hyssop. I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. At the center of David's theology, we see it in this passage, is the understanding that we cannot grow personally without God's help that it is God who cleanses. It is God who creates purity in the heart. God who renews and cultivates willingness in the spirit. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a part to play. We are called to confess. We are called to repent of our sins, to recognize our need for grace. And ultimately, that's what this psalm is really about. That's what I want us to spend the rest of our time this morning on. It's about this idea of repentance. Repentance is an essential element in following Jesus. I'll say that one more time. Repentance is an essential element in following Jesus. In fact, it's so essential that it was John the Baptist's message as the forerunner of Christ. Matthew 3 begins, Within those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. John baptized people and called them to repent of their sins. And then Jesus came to be baptized by John in the Jordan. And he was led by the spirit out into the desert to be tempted for 40 days. And then upon his return, his very first public proclamation, his very first public proclamation, Jesus Christ's very first public proclamation and the foundation of his preaching ministry from that time, Jesus began to preach, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repentance is so foundational to life with God that it was the first sermon of both John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. 
But the concept of repentance has all but disappeared from modern evangelical theology and practice. We don't like to talk about it. We live in a hedonistic society where everybody just kind of does what they want to do, we kind of do what's right in our own eyes. Nobody wants to be accountable for their actions. And self-denial, even though it is central to the call of discipleship in Christ, is labeled harmful and unhealthy in our culture. So how does the church present the gospel in a society like this? I'm afraid our desire to make the call to discipleship as palatable as possible has caused us to offer something that Jesus never offered, a salvation that requires nothing on the part of those receiving it. We have overemphasized the idea of the gift of salvation being free to such a degree that repentance is left by the wayside. We just say things like, just believe. Just bow your head and repeat after me. Just come forward and be baptized. Just call upon the name of the Lord. Nothing else is required. You will be saved. But the undeniable reality of the New Testament is that genuine belief in Jesus is always, without exception, followed by a desire to turn from your sin in repentance and become his disciple. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up and and gave that famous sermon establishing publicly that Jesus had taken his place at the right hand of the Father and assumed his rightful role as Lord over the earth, the people that were listening were cut to the heart with the truth, and they asked the apostles, What shall we do? Peter's response, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The call to salvation, it's been this way since the very beginning. The call to salvation is a call to repent of your sins, to submit your life to the lordship of Jesus, to receive the indwelling of the power and the presence of God through the Holy Spirit. It was designed this way. Grace has always been meant to evoke a response from us. And that response is repentance of sin. This is not a popular message today. It's not something we like spending too much time on. And even the call to repentance can feel offensive to us. We don't want to change our lifestyles. We don't want to give up our our vices and our our guilty pleasures. We're not going to love our enemies. Are you kidding me? We're not going to to bless those who hate us and, and, and pray for those who persecute us. We're not going to do any of that. And when we hear the call to repent, our sin nature immediately kind of pushes back against it. It feels disagreeable to us. The Corinthians felt the same way. This is what Paul said to them. He said, even if I caused you sorrow, and you can read that word as offense as well, by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. And yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry or you were offended, but because your sorrow or your offense led you to repentance. If the gospel message and the mandate that it puts on every one of us to repent of our sins and submit our lives to the lordship of Jesus offends you, understand that that is the first step toward repentance. You have a decision to make. David finished his psalm with these words. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. My brothers and sisters, my prayer for each one of us today is that we would reject the dead trappings of religion and we would lay our hearts and our lives open before God in repentance and submission to the Lordship of Jesus. The beauty of the gospel 
is that it's open to all people. The God of David is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and 77th chances. Whatever you've done, God can redeem it. His mercy is new each morning. No one is ever too lost to be found, too broken to be restored, or too sinful to be forgiven. Repent. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Here are questions for reflection and discussion this week. Where have you seen your sin have a ripple effect? Do you have any unresolved conflict to make right with your neighbor? How does the call to repent inform your view of the Christian life? Let's pray together. Father, we have a challenging subject this morning. It's not one that we enjoy talking about or thinking about. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have our eyes opened to the essential nature repentance has in our faith and our experience as followers of Jesus. Would you help us to have the faith and the courage to confess our sins, to repent of our sins, to truly and earnestly lay our lives down in submission to the Lordship of Jesus? Would you help us to do this? God, would you help us to acknowledge the harm that we have caused in our own relationships? And I know in a room like this right now, God, there are broken and fractured relationships represented. And I pray, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move and soften hearts this morning. You would lead people to take steps that they have needed to take for maybe years, that you would bring them to a place where they would be willing to reach out to someone for whom they've held a grudge or against whom they've had resentment, God, would you, would you draw them and encourage them and give them the conviction to take a step out, reach out to that person and say, I'm sorry, I own my part in that. And as far as it is up to me, I'm going to live at peace with all people. God, would you give us the conviction to do that today in obedience to the call of discipleship? God, would you upend our lives. Give us the faith to do things that we don't want to do, but are good for our souls. Would you teach us what healing and wholeness really looks like and lead us in that narrow path that finds its end in everlasting life. Pray these things in Jesus' name.